Hi, everyone. This is Alan McKay, and welcome to episode 128. I'm speaking with Willie Sussman of Bell Gully, who typically handles all the immigration for Weta, Peter Jackson, and a major authority on anything to do with working or immigrating to New Zealand. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Alan McKay Podcast. Alan is an Emmy Award-winning visual effects artist and mentor to many leading industry experts. Listen in as Alan talks with other industry leaders in film, video games, and visual effects about their experience, lessons, and methodology. Alan will teach you pivotal advice to fast-track your career, better your skills, and reach your ultimate dream job. Check out the latest episodes on alanmckay.com. Okay, so welcome to episode 128. Um, I'm really excited for this episode because I'm going to be interviewing the top immigration firm, specifically Willie Sussman at Bell Gully. And Bell Gully is responsible for handling a majority of the cases for Weta, for Peter Jackson, for immigrating everyone to New Zealand, as well as with James Cameron as well, from my understanding. And... As you might have noticed, bit by bit, I've been going around the world interviewing all of the top immigration lawyers for different countries. So by all over the world, I mean literally interviewing all the top immigration lawyers in various different countries that I feel are very heavy on visual effects, design, games, all the industries that we're in. Okay, so in episode 52, I spoke with Amanda Gillespie about everything to do with work visas. Also episode 54, I shed a lot of light on that as well, going from living in the US um, back in the day, going through many different types of visas to eventually green cards and all the other stuff and really just kind of diving deep and accumulating as much information on the subject as possible. So episode 52 and 54 were on the US. Uh, Episode 83 was with Catherine Sass, who was the top immigration lawyer in Canada and especially focuses on Vancouver's film industry as well. So that one was a huge success. And of course, episode 109, uh, which was with Philip Trott talking about UK and how to work over there as well. So I've definitely tried to cover the bases of all the top places that I can. Um, I want to do Europe next and, and uh, Australia as well. And then from there, maybe dive into Japan and a few other countries on top of that. So I definitely think this is going to be a, a lot of fun. I really kind of want to accumulate all the information I can specifically on this subject because I feel like a lot of us are very lost as to understanding what's involved in going to another country, how to work there, how to get sponsorship, uh, how to approach it all, and also some of the things that you could be doing that might damage your career as well uh, in terms of um, lessening your chances of being able to go to another country. In addition to that, there's also a lot of things that you could be doing now that's going to make it a lot easier to be able to immigrate later on too. So that's exactly why I really want to cover this in depth as much as possible. That being said, this episode is a gold mine of information, both for working in New Zealand, as well as eventually if you wanted to immigrate and live in New Zealand permanently, which I feel like it is one of those hidden places that everyone wants to go to. Maybe they just expect that there's going to be orcs and hobbits and stuff running around. Who knows? But uh, yeah, this episode is really awesome. Again, I want to thank Willie for taking the time out to not only discuss so thoroughly everything to do with New Zealand policies, but also staying in touch after the general election when this was initially recorded to make sure that all the information is up to date and relevant as there was uh, a lot of changes going on at the time. And I don't think I've had a guest who was so on point and making sure that everything is as accurate as possible and up to date. So definitely check out this episode. I think this is going to be really cool. In addition to that, uh, a couple other really cool things coming up very soon. I mentioned I've got a new website coming out probably in March. And typically I wouldn't be so excited about like, hey, I've got a new website coming out. But uh, with this comes a lot of new content. So this is a chance for me to have been really able to dive deep into building up my new home. And it's something that in a way has been in production for about four years and it's finally all coming together. Uh, in the end, 
I've invested a fortune to make this uh, the be all and end all place for visual effects. So um, the main reason I'm excited is because this is going to have a lot of content on there. And uh, right now I've been working on a lot of new guides, everything from how to build a reel that can go viral to uh, an updated hardware guide that we're gonna update, I think every quarter or every half year with all the latest hardware, um, shopping lists, all that stuff to be able to make sure the new workstations that you buy specifically for whatever industry or whatever needs you have are gonna be all in there and we're gonna continue to evolve that. I'm gonna be updating VFX rates with a lot more information. I'm gonna be going deep on that. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of new visual effects tutorials in Max, Maya, Houdini, um, a lot of career related stuff, a lot of videos. And my goal is to start updating this regularly, probably a couple of times a week. And uh, so I'm, that's why I'm really excited about it because for me, I want this to be the be all and end all resource when it comes to really high quality, free training content. And also going beyond that, really focusing on your career. I want a lot of you to be able to learn to treat your art like a business and learn to build your brand, get your name out there, get that exposure, learn to negotiate all the things that we do with the podcast. I want to 10 X. I want to start doing a lot more video, uh, a lot more guides, a lot more uh, live events as well. There's going to be a lot going on. So I'm excited about that. There's so many big announcements I want to mention. Um, but until I can, um, keep an eye out for all the great episodes we've got coming up next episode. I'm going to be interviewing, Jason Martin, who's the creature lead on Doom over at id Software. And after that, uh, I should be interviewing Mark Rienzo, who's the visual effects supervisor for Marvel. And I've got episodes with Ryan Connolly and a lot of other really amazing individuals. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. 2018 is going to be a killer year. And that being said, let's get into this episode. If you have any follow-up questions, feel free to leave a comment in the show notes or shoot me an email. I'd love to hear from you. And uh, if there is a lot of questions, maybe I can get Willie back for a Q&A. Uh, again, I'm sure a lot of us have a lot of interest in being able to work for Weta, move to New Zealand, all of those sorts of things. So that being said, if you want to check out the show notes, simply go to www.allenmckay.com. So A-L-L-A-N-M ckay.com slash 128 for episode 128. All right, so that being said, let's dive in. Yeah, I just want to again say thanks for taking the time to do this. And if you want to quickly just introduce yourself and also Bell Gully, just to um, give a bit of a brief overview of um, what you guys do and the typical clients that you guys have. Sure. Um, good morning. And thanks very much for inviting me to talk to you. Um, my name's Willie Sussman. I'm a partner with Val Gully. Um, it is a, a very old and well-established firm that has offices both in Auckland and in Wellington. Um, we're a full service firm, um, which means that for clients we're able to do everything from immigration to tax um, to structuring their affairs uh, to borrowing money and structuring loans to establishing companies and corporate structures. Um, dealing with the overseas uh, investment office if that's needed um, through to establishing trust uh, and if uh, in the unfortunate situation that there needs to be litigation then we have litigation department as well. Um, we have a wide variety of clients um, in our immigration practice. Um, we act for um, uh, a very um, significant number of um, high net worth individuals um, we also act for uh, many companies in terms of um, uh, their employees and migration to New Zealand. And we also act for many individuals, um, more often than not, who have encountered some difficulties or challenges in the immigration process. So um, quite a wide variety of work. That's really awesome, actually. Like, um, th that's one thing I've experienced a little bit with a lot of immigration firms I speak to is one thing is like not really having um, much experience with accounting, taxation, and all those areas. And uh, so it's pretty cool that you guys actually offer such a 360 degree um, set of, of skills to be able to kind of focus on because it, I guess it means that anyone who's having to kind of travel that landscape of, um, let's say, setting up a new company in a remote area of the world and all these other uh, things that come with it. Usually you've got to bring in so many different parties and try and figure out who to speak to about what. But it sounds like you guys are able to kind of um, really 
take their case on and be able to handle a lot of different areas. So that's really great. And um, just to uh, cover a little bit, I mean, one thing that we had talked about just a few minutes before we started, but one thing was a lot of the current events going on in New Zealand. And I guess um, with a country that's growing so rapidly, I guess there is going to be a lot uh, of change, um, you know, in such a short amount of time for you, like what are some of the, the big things that have kind of changed or um, have been kind of growing in the, the past couple of months? Um, quite right, Alan. Um, and, and the past couple of months have seen substantial change. And I expect that um, in the next short while there will be further change. Um, New Zealand was a country that for many years experienced a brain drain. Um, that brain drain was predominantly to our neighbor, Australia. Uh, lots of people moving to New Zealand. Um, we then had uh, a reversal of that with New Zealand's fortunes perhaps um, outshining um, our bigger cousin. Uh, we had fewer New Zealanders returning. Uh, we had uh, more new arrivals. Um, that gave rise to a chronic housing shortage. Um, housing shortages, of course, led to um, more demand and less supply, and so we had rampant house price inflation, um, lack of affordability, um, a perception that foreigners were buying our houses, uh, that our children might become a generation of renters. Um, the auction rooms were dominated by what were at least apparently thought to be foreign buyers, um, and there was uh, real pressure on, on New Zealand and its resources. Um, at the same time, there's a recognition that New Zealand is an importer of capital, not just financial capital, but human capital as well. Um, there were, as we all know, and have been uncertain times in many other countries. New Zealand was thought to be a, a paradise far from the world's problem areas, um, and having the right of residence in New Zealand was thought to be a safe haven. Um, money that came into New Zealand under the investor categories tended to stay, um, and there were revisions to the overseas investment rules to do with um, who could buy land here and, and what type of land and what criteria need to be satisfied. We have recently had general elections and housing, poverty, um, the right of, of, of residence in New Zealand were all central themes. Um, we now have a new government. Um, central left government. Um, it's a government of minority parties and many promises were made and those promises um, are yet to come to fruition in terms of actual policy um, but what has been spoken about is the need to construct at least 10,000 new homes above the uh, quota usually built per annum. Um, there's uh, also talk about non-residents, whatever non-residents might mean, not being able to buy existing houses. In other words, they might have to buy land and, and build new houses. Um, a tightening of some of the overseas uh, investment office requirements. Um, uh, on the other hand, um, perhaps immigration has already peaked and some of the concerns that the minority government is now addressing uh, are concerns that are already abating. Um, but New Zealand remains an attractive country. Um, uh, Weta is obviously um, well known. Um, Peter Jackson is well known. James Cameron is well known. Lord of the Rings uh, attracts um, much attention. And so uh, New Zealand remains a, uh, a, a favoured destination um, for people wanting to come either temporarily or permanently. Mm -hmm. That's great. And I guess like, you know, obviously there's a lot of different moving parts there that you had mentioned, but um, how overall is that affecting things at the moment, given the fact that a lot of this is more recent? Um, life, life continues in the sense that applications continue to come in and to be um, uh, processed and progressed. Um, but uh, there, is, there, there is, we are going through a period of, of uncertainty where um, the policy that was described in in, um, in election uh, manifestos now needs to be put into practice. Absolutely. And I guess as with anywhere, I mean, obviously, when there is a lot of growth and it happens, you know, on small scales and larger scales, but um, there's always going to be that disruption. And, um, you know, in the long run, having more people 
uh, moving anywhere is, is usually going to be a good thing. But obviously, uh, short term, as I mentioned, there is going to be that disruption where things need to adjust. And um, at the same time, like people's reaction to it all, too, especially um, if you're used to having more of a small population and suddenly you've got a lot of foreigners um, coming in as well, you know, I'm sure there is a little bit of resistance there just because anyone is always going to, you know, be less comfortable with change. But um, overall, I mean, what was the, you know, from memory, what was the population, let's say, five years ago compared to now or 10 years ago compared to now? Like how drastically has the population in New Zealand expanded? Um, that's an interesting question because uh, the population has certainly grown substantially. Um, two things have happened, I think. The one is that the population in general has grown uh, and the other is that the population has been concentrated um, in the big cities and in particular in Auckland. Um, and so um, we have movement from the country areas into the cities. We have um, congestion in, in, in our roading system. Uh, we have infrastructure which is straining at the seams. Um, we then had um, a move to some of the provincial areas because people simply haven't been able to afford housing uh, in, in, in the urban areas. Um, and so quite a, quite a changing dynamic against a backdrop where um, um, those sorts of increases had been um, far slower in prior periods. Um, so, for example, it's proposed that we're going to have um, a, a fuel tax of 10 cents per litre in the Auckland area um, simply to fund infrastructure. Um, so in answer to your question, um, I think I think the Greater Auckland um, is now at about 1.5 million people um, and the projections are that it's going to grow by another half a million um, I think in, in, in the next 10 years. So um, big growth, um, big growth and, 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 and pressure on resources. Right. Uh, it's it's kind of funny on a small scale, like um, I just moved from Los Angeles where I've pretty much lived since I was about 21. Uh, I moved up north to Portland and Portland's kind of right in the middle of Vancouver, which is the film capital of the world these days in Los Angeles. And there's a lot of Californians migrating up to Portland because it is one of those kind of untapped havens that everyone's loving. And um, so because of that, there is um, a lot of change happening as well as obviously just being able to handle the capacity of traffic, um, housing, all those other things. It, it sounds very similar in terms of there being um, a huge adjustment period where um, because of that, there's yeah a, a lot going on and, and it's very hard to kind of react uh, as quick as you can to kind of compensating for you know your population increase so drastic. Um, but that's really cool. And I guess to kind of take that concept a bit further, I mean, I think that a lot of people um, wanting to work in other countries, a lot of the time they don't really have too much experience with understanding work visas and what it takes to work in other countries. And, um, you know, obviously with Weta, with uh, some of the game studios and a lot of the other um, uh, TV and film companies in New Zealand, there is that growth where a lot of people are migrating over specifically for film, which uh, a lot of my audience um, is in. And for that, for those people who aren't familiar with uh, the process, and again, this is a much bigger question, but do you want to shed a little bit of light on um, the subject of working in New Zealand? And obviously that means from initially coming over for a visit or for temporary work all the way through to, um, you know, what it would take to become a permanent resident or citizen. Um, and again, I, I imagine this is a, a bit more of a bird's eye view, but if you want to shed some light on that for anyone who is not familiar, that would be really great. Um, certainly. Um, there are many categories, um, and and I think it is helpful, or hopefully it will be helpful to listeners to, to, to get some sort of a sense of that progression. Um, uh, at, at the... Um, at the one extreme uh, would be people just coming in on holiday and um, and there be categories where people could um, get a visa on arrival. Uh, um, the next category would be people who would need to apply for a holiday visa before arriving here. Um, in terms of those sorts of visas, those are visas that would not entitle one to work in New Zealand. And a really important point there is that um, people should not arrive under um, a holiday visa expecting to work um, because there can be serious repercussions um, if 
if it should be discovered that they are working illegally, uh, not only in terms of their being denied entry to New Zealand, but also in terms of blotting their copybook um, if later they should um, want to, to go down the more official route of, of, of working in New Zealand. So I would strongly advise people not to come in on a, on a holiday visa and, and undertake work. But back to the question, uh, what would the progression be? So visas either on arrival or applied for, um, then there are visas which uh, relate to um, uh, people coming here for a specific purpose, um, to undertake a specific task, and, and, and we refer to those as specific purpose work visas, um, then people who have essential skills um, and who come in under an essential skills visa. Um, the important point um, here to note is that uh, both the essential skills visa and the specific purpose visa are visas that entitle you to work, but they don't lead to the right to remain in New Zealand permanently. Um, mm -hmm. That then changes when we get to the next categories of visas, which uh, progressively, if one can think of it as a progression, would be the work to residence visa or coming in as a skilled migrant under the skilled migrant visas um, or coming in under one of the investor visas um, which require uh, either $3 million to be invested or, or $10 million uh, and then ultimately citizenship which is something which um, you, you don't apply for from outside the country. That is something that um, once you've been here for a prescribed period of time, uh, you can apply for. So to run through them again, holiday visas, essential skills, specific purpose, work to residence, skilled migrant, and investor visas. Great. That's really awesome. And so just to be clear, um, the essential skills and the specific purpose, like um, what would those two typically entail? Like what would be the difference between them yeah. and also what usually the requirements? Um, let, let's deal with specific purpose first because it's, um, it, it, it's probably easier. Um, so a specific purpose work visa is um, job or project specific. Um, so if um, someone had a need to commission plant in New Zealand or if someone was needed in New Zealand to work um, equipment, it might be film equipment, it might be editing equipment, um, and there was a real scarcity of people with that particular talent, then um, they might come in um, either to do the job or to, to help commission the project. Um, the point there is that um, once uh, the job's been done or the project's been completed, um, then the visa ends uh, and that's the end of it. And it is able to be extended, of course, if the project extends. Mm -hmm. um, one, the, the, the employer would need to show what makes uh, the person required uh, for that project. Um, and uh, that could impl include, um, you know, people like uh, performers and their crew um, who might be needed uh, for a film project. Um, and, and as I say, it, it, it's, it's, it's limited to the task that they're needed for here. That's right. Um, in terms of the essential skills visa, that is more complicated. Um, th there is a list which is published of um, skills that New Zealand considers essential. In other words, things that we're short of. Um, and that list changes. Um, as, as, as obviously the landscape changes. Um, the visa for essential skills is not geographically limited. Um, it is employer specific. Um, so in other words, you would come in to work for, uh, Weta and, and, and you couldn't simply change jobs half, halfway through. Mm. Um, it, it, it is not a points based system. Um, when we talk about the skilled migrant system, that is points-based. Um, and the qualifications for uh, what is regarded as essential um, need to be set by the employer. Um, then what happens is the particular skill in question is given a ranking um, based on um, something called an ANSCO code. So it's a system um, jointly administered by New Zealand and Australia. Uh, where each job uh, is given a rating having regard to um, the skills that are needed and the experience that is needed 
uh, for that particular uh, particular job. So um, to recap, the employer would would say that they need a particular person who w was on the essential skills list, and then depending on um, two factors, the ANSCO rating and the pay that is offered for that that job, um, one might get uh, a work visa that was for three years or might be for five years or, or, or close to five years um, if one was at the high end of skills and the high end of, of the pay scale. Great. There's another important point there that I should have mentioned and that is um, the employer would need to show that uh, they had advertised for for that particular um, skill um, and had no luck in finding somebody local. Um, and the advertising requirements are pretty strict. Um, important that employers don't think that they can um, simply uh, put in an advert in, in in an obscure newspaper and hope to satisfy the mm -hmm. advertising criteria that way. Um, and, and they then need to be able to show that there's uh, no New Zealander presently available or um, a New Zealander who might readily, easily be trained to do the task. So a bit of a challenge, um, but not impossible. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, I think that's a really valuable thing for a lot of people to understand because I have kind of seen the other end of the spectrum where people are complaining that, let's say, the um, the job requirements to work at a company or you know if you're an immigrant are too high or um, just a lot of misunderstandings about why certain companies are going to require a certain amount of experience and, and other things. And that's because typically when an employer is looking to hire someone to come and work for the company, it's not that their requirements are so high. It's because they need to fit the criteria of their government and their immigration requirements for that person. And one of the key things is that you you need to point out that no one else in the country technically can do what you do to be able to qualify for that visa. I mean, um, I think that a lot of people don't understand or don't really think about the fact that if you're coming over to another country to work at their company, technically that is taking a citizen's job in that country. And it's it's not necessarily as black and white as that, but when you start to add up the amount of people who are migrating and working remotely in other uh, locations, it, it is one of those things that um, there is sometimes going to be um, a bit of an imbalance there where if too many foreigners are coming over and taking jobs, uh, they are ruining opportunities for people who are residents or sorry, citizens of that country. So that's definitely something that um, it's it's good that you brought it up that, you know, for a company to bring in someone else, they do need to point out that, um, you know, they have looked for people to qualify for that position before they can really bring in someone um, to fill that position from another country. Absolutely right. The advantage, I suppose, in 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 a growing country like New Zealand is that um, there, there tends to be an ongoing shortage of of skills as new industries develop, um, and especially if they do well. That's really great. And I guess with the skilled migrant, that's more of a specialty visa. So I'm assuming that that's one that isn't as easy to get, and it's more for people who are kind of at the top of their field um, and have all the, I guess. Um, you know, work history awards or whatever else to kind of back that up. Like, what what would be the big difference between the uh, the essential skills and the specific person, uh, sorry, purpose visa for uh, for the skilled migrant one? Um, the the I think a couple of things that that are uh, important differences. Um, both the essential skills and specific purpose are, are task or project driven and time limited, whereas the work to residence and the skilled migrant are both visas that entitle the holder to work and which are designed with the intention that the holder of that visa will in due course be entitled to remain in New Zealand indefinitely. Um, so we'll come back to the work to residence visa um, since you've spoken about the skilled migrant visa. Um, uh, the skilled migrant visa um, I don't think that I would discount that um, the way you suggested one might need to. Um, that is a visa which takes into account um, both the qualifications of the person, um, their work experience, um, and their age predominantly. There are other criteria as well. Um, 
And, and if one has a job offer, um, and especially if the job offer is in an area where there is a skill shortage, um, if the offer is outside of Auckland, where, as I mentioned, there are pressures on housing and infrastructure, um, where uh, one gets more points as well if one has a partner who has qualifications that are that, that are regarded as in, in short supply, um, then, then one goes through a process where one uh, lodges an expression of interest, um, which is, I suppose, a short form application that describes in summary one's, one's case or one's position. Um, and if one accumulates sufficient points um, from from that application, then one might be invited to apply. Um, so, so to recap, if you've got skills, if you've got a job offer, if you've got experience, and if you think that you can get to the number of points needed, then you might lodge an expression of interest and see whether um, your expression of interest is drawn from the pool. So. Um, what happens is that you lodge that expression of interest and it remains in a pool um, drawn um, every two weeks um, and it stays in the pool either until you are selected or until it's been in the pool for six months. Right. Um, uh, and 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 that there, there's a pass mark which at the moment is about 160 points um, and that point level is not a preset points level, but rather it's calculated by identifying from past applicants um, the lowest number of points that an application had which qualified. So that that number of points will fluctuate up or down as there are more applicants with higher skills applying or fewer applicants with lower skills. Okay. Um, there's an important point to, to note here, and that is that um, the expression of interest doesn't require one to submit evidence of everything that one's claiming points for. But And so theoretically, um, one could lodge an expression of interest um, claiming that one had experience that one didn't have, qualifications that one didn't really quite have, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if one was then drawn and could not substantiate the claims made, um, then one would go nowhere um, and it might be frowned upon, to put it lightly, um, if one had wasted Immigration New Zealand's time by making spurious claims about, uh, or claims that one couldn't substantiate in terms of one's experience or qualifications. So that's a really important point. Okay, so how do you mean, like, it wouldn't go lightly, like, is there any repercussions for submitting or applying for a visa saying that you have um, you know, immaculate um, credentials when, in fact, you're you're kind of lying or embellishing on that. Like, what would be the repercussion? Well, you you you'd have you'd um, um you you'd, you'd lose any money that you'd um, submitted with your expression of interest, mm -hmm. um, and um, you you couldn't uh, you you would be declined. And when you applied again, if that was what you chose to do. Um, a question would be asked as to whether you'd ever been declined, right. to which you'd have to answer yes. Uh, and if you answered no, then that could have even more serious repercussions. You're digging so a I think hole. <laughs> you, you're digging a hole for yourself. And, and, and I think that um, digging a hole for yourself is, is almost a subject, um, a subject on its own. Um, it goes without saying that applying for a visa is an extremely important thing. Um, and being absolutely honest and absolutely transparent, um, and if in doubt, um, over overstate the detail that that, that 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 might be required rather than understate it, mm. um, because what you don't what you don't want is um, to have to answer questions later about why it was that you hadn't mentioned a, a prosecution or why it was that you hadn't mentioned. A particular health problem that that your dependent might have. Those are those are not good situations to be in. Right, that's good to know. And how long typically does the process take to uh, acquire a visa? And again, I'm assuming it's probably on more of a per visa basis, depending on the type that you're applying for. But in general, like um, from 
initially um, sending in your application or having the company you're working for apply for you, uh, how long should someone, someone expect um, to get a response about whether they're approved? Um, just just, just a, a typical lawyer comment before, before answering the question. Um, the fine print to the answer reads, provided everything in the application <laughs> is perfect Absolutely. and there are no blem and there are no blemishes right so on the assumption that the application is perfect and 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 by that I mean comprehensive um, well set out all of the all of the detail and and supporting documents included um, and and just on that on that note um, there are some people who um, it would seem might adopt the attitude that New Zealand is really just a small island in the Pacific um, and um, almost good enough uh, will be good enough for them. Um, that, I can assure listeners, is not the case. Um, New Zealand is very thorough in uh, reviewing applications and um, almost is not good enough. So in answer to your question, how long do they take? Um, essential skills visas, um, especially given that they they are, as the name suggests, something that, that, that is needed uh, essentially and, and often urgently. Um, once you get that visa in, in six weeks. Okay, great. Um, a specific purpose work visa similarly might be even uh, a, a week or two shorter than that. Um, a uh, skilled migrant visa is really um, in a different category because, um, as we've mentioned, that is something which will then entitle one to remain in New Zealand indefinitely. Um, that's likely to take between nine months and a year. Um, and then there's the work to residence visa, which we haven't yet spoken about, which um, I think we should speak about briefly. Mm -hmm. And that can be obtained um, probably in, in, in about a period of about a month. Right. Um, so in summary, the, the work to residence visa is um, a visa that's granted for uh, 30 months. Um, entitles one to come to New Zealand uh, to work and after 24 months um, one can apply um, for that effectively to, to, to be commuted um, to, to a residence visa rather than just a work visa. Um, but the criteria for that are very prescriptive um, and, and so it can be a, a tough visa to apply for. There are three categories that are relevant. Um, either the person is on the long-term skills shortage list, um, a list which, as the name implies, is one which is considered New Zealand really does need and it's been evident for a while that we need those people, um, or that one has particular talent, um, or that one's working for a so-called accredited employer. Um, the, the talent, um, the description of, of talent um, is that one needs to um, be considered to have exceptional talent um, in a declared field of art, culture or sport. Um, immigration New Zealand needs to be satisfied that the person has an international reputation and a record of excellence in that declared field and that the person remains prominent in that field and that the applicant's presence in New Zealand is going to enhance the quality of New Zealand's accomplishments mm -hmm. um, in that field of art, culture, or sport. So quite a quite a high threshold. Um, but if one did meet those tests, then one could get a visa um, in in probably uh, the, about a month, um, which which would obviously be far shorter than the skilled migrant route, um, and would lead to um, the right to remain in New Zealand permanently, just like the skilled migrant. Um, there's a, 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 a 55 year um, age um, threshold. You've got to be under. You've got to be 55 uh, or under, and one has to be earning at least um, 55,000 New Zealand dollars a year to fit within uh, the, the criteria for that visa. Okay, that's really great. And from there, um, that can lead to citizenship and everything else. Citizenship is is a slightly different animal. Um, Let's talk about that very briefly. Citizenship um, requires one to have been lawfully um, resident in New Zealand. In other words, a stowaway um, uh, who hasn't been detected doesn't qualify for citizenship. So lawfully present in New Zealand for um, five consecutive years, um, where in each of those five years, 
one has been present for at least 240 days and where in aggregate um, those five years um, get to 1,350 days or more. Um, so that's, that's the requirement for citizenship. Great. It's really cool. And I'm just curious, um, in terms of actual credentials, and this might be more for some uh, visas than others, but um, in terms of credentials and things like that, like um, does having a degree help your chances? Um, actually, in fact, let's just talk about the degree first. I mean, having a formal education versus experience and reputation, how do they weigh? Because, for instance, the United States is starting to catch up a little bit more, but let's say compared to Switzerland where they're more modern in terms of identifying like what makes you an integral addition to the country, um, the United States still might rely on more formal qualifications to, to say whether or not you know you are valid to, um, to come into the country. So for New Zealand, would that be something that weighs more clout than um, you know awards or anything like that? Or, or how does that play? Well, I think it really is is um, uh, a question of um, of which particular visa category. Because, for example, if one was coming in under the work to residence visa and um, one had particular talent, um, then then that talent might be such that one had no qualifications whatsoever if one was recognised as um, a world leader or the world leader in that field. Um, uh, on the other hand, um, the, the, under the skilled migrant category, um, there are at present more points potentially awarded to qualifications than there are to work experience. Um, I just did a, a, a quick add up of, of, of the potential points, including points that one might get for one's partner if, if that partner also had those qualifications and the tally um, at best, uh, the best case scenario is that for qualifications one might get 105 possible points and for work experience one might get 75. So I think that answers your question. It, it is still tipped um, slightly in favour of, um, of qualifications. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good to know. And in terms of other areas, like again, to help get your points up to help kind of um you know, have those credentials, um, do, you know, what are some of the typical things that people should probably start to think about? Like, let's say that you're not looking to, to work necessarily in New Zealand right away, but this is something that you want to eventually do. Um, are there things that people can start to think about now? Like in the past, I've always mentioned, you know, it's good to start tracking any publications that have been written about you from a newspaper clipping to magazine articles, you know, online, um, you know, anything like that, awards, um, anything that is of significance that's going to help um, build your case to kind of um, prove that you're someone who is qualified in, in your area or, as you mentioned, could be possibly a world leader in that area. So um, just to recap, like, yeah. are there certain things that you can do to kind of help increase your chances and is, what are the things that you should think about ahead of time so that way you have all that to kind of make the case easy when, when it is time? Um, a, a good question and to some extent a bit of a, a, a two-edged sword. Um, I'll explain why. First, I think in terms of accumulating evidence of your expertise or, 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 or your achievements, I think they are important, but they probably go more to where on the ANSCO code one might be able to slot oneself rather than being something that would be included um, with the application that goes to Immigration New Zealand. So I think all of those attributes and all of those qualifications and achievements are important in terms of securing the job offer, which will be um, vital in terms of, uh, a as an absolute, in terms of some categories, and will be really important in terms of points for other categories. Um, but then I think uh, there's a bit of a, a catch-22 because Age is a factor for which um, points are, are, are given and um, one's, one's health is uh, another category which is important. So I'm assuming that most younger people are healthier than older people, so that mitigates in favour of um, being younger when you apply. There's the age cutoff for some of the categories, which of course means that you need to be younger. Um, in terms of points for age under the skilled migrant category, which is one which is easily measured, 
um, between the age of 20 and 39, one gets 30 points. Uh, between 40 and 44, 20 points. 45 to 49, 10 points. And by the time you turn 50, you only get five points. So um, more time to accumulate uh, expertise, qualifications, etc. But while you're doing that, um, you're you're um, you're going backwards on the, the 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 points for age, and there's the medical side of things. Um, so I think important. Um, the ideal, obviously, is to um, get lots of accolades uh, and lots of qualifications early uh, and apply soon. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's good to know. <laughs> what, what, one thing that that we haven't spoken about is um, is uh, health and and police clearance, mm -hmm. um, and we should talk about that briefly. So, if one's going to be in New Zealand for twelve months or more, then one is required to have a medical, um, and and that's important to make sure that um, uh, one isn't going to be a drain on New Zealand resources. Um, the medical is 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 fairly thorough, um, and if one happened to be declined on medical grounds, then with very limited exceptions, um, one can apply for a medical waiver, um, which is something that we've done quite a bit of for clients. Um, and essentially, it's a case of being able to prove or argue the case that uh, the risk of of costs associated with the applicant or their family being in New Zealand um, are smaller than the benefit that they are likely to bring to New Zealand. Um, and the other is um, that if one's going to be here for two years or more, then one needs to get um, police clearances um, from one's country of citizenship and any country that during the last 10 years, cumulatively, one has spent 12 months or more. Um, and and again, I can't overemphasize the importance of um, of absolute transparency. If if you've had a problem in the past, um, deal with it by making it known when you lodge your application. Uh, by all means, um, try as best you can to um, provide context, um, explain how um, you might have been young and irrational at the time, but how much you've changed. Uh, or, or whatever, but don't hide things because uh, they come back and bite you um, very hard. In my experience, absolutely, yeah, it's better to be candid and uh, yeah, open and honest about anything. You know, especially when you're dealing with governments and immigration. So I think that's really valid. I was actually um, I had a meeting not long ago with the Department of Homeland Security here in the U.S. and I was chatting to the the guy there, and he was saying how he had just recently interviewed this older Russian lady who was applying for a green card and uh, she had had her lawyer with her, which is completely fine, but um, was asking in Russian to her lawyer, should she mention the, uh, the time that she stole a car when she was younger? And um, they both decided not to say anything, but uh, the, the guy interviewing them actually spoke Russian and completely understood what they were saying. So instantly got mm -hmm. denied. And the worst part is in a situation like that is that, you know, not only are you blatantly pointing out that you're lying about something, but even if it, if there is a misconception about something, um, if you don't have a chance to defend yourself and explain the situation, which means, you know, if you weren't up for an honest in the first place and mention it, then, um, yeah, then it's only going to be what's, what's the facts are. In, in other words, um, you know, whatever has been done has been done. So it's better to kind of take that opportunity to be upfront and honest about a situation, as you mentioned, being young and maybe intoxicated or whatever it is that um, might have gone with it, uh, because that's a chance to actually explain it rather than it being that you dismissed it and it comes up later to kind of bite you in the butt. Couldn't agree more. Cool. And um, just to, I, I think that's really great to kind of cover that because you're right, like, um, you know, both of those, especially immigrating to any country, they, they become very important um, to to make sure that you have got that covered. Um, in terms of the Commonwealth and also for Australian citizens too, do you want to quickly um, mention, like, is there any advantages, I guess, for being in the Commonwealth for countries like UK, Australia, places like that? Um, well, I think the first thing to note is that um, there is no preference given to people in the Commonwealth, uh, nor is there any uh, disadvantage given to, to anyone from, from any particular country. Um, um, Australia is um, in, in, in a different category. Um, uh, Australians can, as of right, um, work 
in New Zealand and live in New Zealand, um, it, it's it's pretty much free entry for Australians. That's cool. And so you can literally just hop on a plane and you know start working Monday without really needing to go through any uh, permit process. That's right. That's right. And how do taxes work? You um, you just pay taxes in both countries. Um, well, taxes is is an interesting one. So. Um, some countries um, tax on a source basis, some countries tax on a residence basis, um, and, and there are variations on the theme. New Zealand taxes on a residence basis. Uh, in other words, once you are tax resident in New Zealand, then you are taxable in New Zealand on your worldwide income. And then when you cease to be res tax resident in New Zealand, um, then you would not be taxable in New Zealand on any of your income, with one exception, and that is that um, if the source of your income is New Zealand, then you'll be taxable on that in New Zealand. So let's talk about that briefly. Um, personal services income, if you're, if you're doing work in New Zealand, uh, if you're earning rent from land in New Zealand, all of those things will have a New Zealand source. Um, and so irrespective of whether you're a tax resident here or not, that will uh, attract New Zealand tax. Um, I mentioned the word tax resident. You will be tax resident in New Zealand from the first day in any period of 365 days during which in aggregate you were here for 183 days or more. So effectively it, it is a test which, um, which looks back to the, 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 first of, the first day in that 12 month period um, and says from that first day in which during the 12-month period, you were here for 183. Um, you'll be tax resident in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. um, you're also sorry. You were going to say? Oh no, no. I was just uh, I was just agreeing. Right. right. And then uh, you'd also be tax resident in, in New Zealand if you had a, uh, a permanent home available to you in New Zealand. Um, all of that is subject to a number of of, of ifs and buts, um, and they are that. If you are in a country that has a double tax treaty with New, with New Zealand, then um, the double tax treaty may um, change that outcome. Um, and the other is that if you were then if you then landed up being tax resident in two countries, or if two countries tax the same income, then it's likely that you'd get a tax credit um, for the tax paid in the other jurisdiction. Um, there is a, a 92 day exemption. Um, for people who come to New Zealand um, effectively to work for a foreign employer, um, uh, a secondment type arrangement, so you wouldn't be taxable in New Zealand on that. And another rule which is important, and that is that if you come to New Zealand for the first time or for the first time in 10 years, then from the date on which you would ordinarily become tax resident, you have a 48-month um, period during which you would be classed as a transitional resident and during the period where you are a transitional resident you would only be taxable on personal services income uh, whether that was earned in New Zealand or abroad. So a number of layers that one would need to look at um, and plan for um, when one was looking at, at tax consequences. Great. And um, one thing I was going to just mention on top of that, uh, actually, you mentioned the whole double tax treaty. Like, do you want to quickly mention, like, what are some of the countries that qualify for that? Uh, New Zealand has, has many, many countries. Uh, there are many countries with, New Zealand, with which New Zealand has treaties. So um, certainly with the U.S., uh, with Australia, um, with the U.K., um, with pretty much every country in Europe um, and, and many other countries. Okay, great. And what about spouse visas if you're coming over to work? Um, uh, obviously, the U.S., like that's one where typically your partner might not be able to work even though you're legal to work. But for New Zealand, um, if you come over, you're married, uh, typically your spouse would be able to work as well? Um, yes. Um, under the skilled migrant visa, um, y your spouse would, would be a secondary applicant. Um, and, and an important point, um, talking generally about spouses, uh, the first is that um, New Zealand has adopted um, an approach that that is um, very accepting of of spouses in in, in all categories. So um, same sex marriages um, are completely recognised, um, and for a person to be a spouse, um, they don't need to have uh, they don't need to be married. 
um, as long as they are living together in a genuine and stable relationship and have been for uh, a long enough period of time, then they'd qualify as a spouse. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is that when one looks at um, ability to come to New Zealand, um, one should not overlook the possibility that um, one spouse, uh, or rather, that, that the person who was thinking of being the primary applicant might be better off being the secondary applicant um, because their spouse might have more points mm -hmm. than uh, they might have. So certainly under the skilled migrant category, uh, no issue with with um, with a spouse. Um, running through the other categories, it depends on which category um, you're in, but more often than not, um, a spouse can get a visa to come and work uh, with with uh, the, the the applicant, um, whether it be male, female, or whatever. Okay, that's really great, and yeah, that's good to know too. Um... Because, yeah, I guess if your partner is a doctor or maybe in certain areas where there's a, a need for builders and things like that, that actually might work in your favor to kind of swap it around. So Absolutely. that way, yeah, that's great. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, just one thing to bear in mind, um, where there are criteria that need to be satisfied after arrival, in other words, um, that you're given the go-ahead to come to New Zealand, but you must you must remain in New Zealand for a period of time or maintain an investment in New Zealand for a period of time uh, or, or any other requirement. Mm -hmm. That requirement will be imposed on the principal applicant and right. and and the secondary applicant um, will will fail if the primary applicant doesn't do what's required of them. Um, so in some unfortunate situations, um, a couple may come to New Zealand and the primary applicant may separate from the secondary applicant um, and may, for example, choose to leave New Zealand. And much as the secondary applicant might want to stay, um, because the primary applicant or the principal applicant has left, if remaining here or maintaining an, in, maintaining an investment here for a, a period of time is a requirement, then uh, much as the secondary applicant would like to stay, um, they, they fail, as I say. So just something to bear in mind. That's good to know. And um, if you want to touch on that just for a couple of seconds, because I, I think that might segue well into a couple of questions I have. Um, for someone, let's say, in that exact situation, if they decided they wanted to stay, obviously they need to qualify themselves. But would they reach out to, let's say, a firm like yours or others um, to try and go through that process while they're in the country or would they need to leave the country to uh, begin the process over? Uh, generally, um, they would need to apply when, when they were outside New Zealand. Um, th there might be some exceptions, um, but generally one couldn't come here on a holiday visa and then apply for a work visa or permanent residence generally. Um, but there are exceptions. Right. So worst case, go to Australia for a couple of days and <laughs> start the process. Um, but yeah, no, I, I understand what you're saying. And so same thing, like what happens if you were to lose your job or or whatever the situation might be? Um, what? How long do you usually have before you need to leave the country? What's the exit process like? Um, do you have options if you were working at a company and uh, for whatever reason the job was terminated? Um, is there any options there to extend your stay and like apply for a position elsewhere or how would that work? Yeah, um, th th there's no prescribed time limit of how long you have within which to do things, um, but you'd be well advised um, not to uh, not to wait long at all. Um, there are some visas that, um, you know, for example, the essential skills visa, uh, work visa um, is, is employer specific. Um, so if that job disappeared, um, I, I think that you would have quite a challenge finding somebody else that could take you over in short order, given that they would need to have advertised and proved that there was nobody available or available to be trained. But, you know, um, never the long day, um, and, and, and one might have a situation that, that qualified. Whereas, for example, the work-to-residence visa is, is not, if one came in because of talent, um, that wouldn't be employer specific, um, and so there'd be nothing that would tie you to to, to any employer. Um, a skilled migrant, um, you, you would you would want to have claimed points um, for a job offer uh, because 
of the 160 that you need, um, 50 are awarded for having um, employment um, um, in 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 New Zealand. Um, so you, if you lost your job, um, I don't think that that would disqualify you because it would be measured at the time at which your application was approved. So it really depends right. on on the category. Um, I think again, some some of the important points are thoroughness, comprehensiveness, transparency. Um, and, 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 and I would add to that communication. So um, don't wait for the authorities to come to you. Um, tell them that um, you've lost your job. Tell them how unfortunate it is. Tell them how well settled you and, 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 and your, your family are uh, and, and ask for some indulgence and explain what you're going to do. Um, don't wait for them to come knocking. That's really great advice. Um, I've got a couple of more quick questions, then we'll start to wrap things up. But I guess like one of the, the obvious questions, but Weta and Lord of the Rings obviously has globally made a massive impact on New Zealand. Um, when Weta first started, and obviously it's fluctuated, I think it's up to 1,000 employees at the moment, or it occasionally gets up to that stage. Um, how much has that impacted immigration policies in, the, in New Zealand, given the fact that obviously uh, a lot of international talent needs to come in for film production, both for shooting as well as for post-production, visual effects, that sort of thing? Um, it, it's, it, it's a hard question to answer because um, one would need to know what the counterfactual was. Um, but, but I would say that, first of all, immigration in New Zealand is very, very conscious of, of, of Weta. Um, conscious of its reputation, conscious of um, the fact that it, it helps to keep New Zealand on the map and in, uh, in the forefront of people's minds in, in, in terms of thinking of um, those sorts of industries. And so I don't think that they, that they would be said to get special treatment, but if an application came in in relation to somebody who was looking to work at Weta, um, there would be no issue in terms of um, trying to identify whether this was a credible organization with a good mm -hmm. reputation um, and whether it really it did need people or not because all of those would be would be given um, so um, certainly from that perspective um, um, it, it has had and they continue to have an impact on on immigration policy recognizing that um, they, they're certainly not a flash in the pan they're important to New Zealand and that um, that they have a growing number of employees, um, all of whom uh, are needed. That's great. And I know this is a question that you can probably answer really well, which is um, what typically will happen if someone was applying for uh, a visa to work in New Zealand and they got denied? Um, what usually would be the, the step after kind of receiving the denial? Um, what usually happens is that the application is lodged and they 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 usually not deny one one it's unusual to find that the next piece of correspondence is a denial uh, the next piece of correspondence is is um, usually um, identified as a so-called PPI a potentially uh, prejudicial uh, that they're looking for potentially prejudicial information in other words um, we note that um, the degree that you um, claim to have comes from um, an educational establishment um, that we've not been able to identify. Um, can you please give us more information about um, about this establishment? Um, therefore, putting you on notice that there might be a problem um, and identifying to you that um, your answer might potentially be prejudicial to your application. Um, it's at that point that um, if you're not seeing a lawyer, you might want to. Um, and so it's not really uh, a, an application followed by a decline. Um, if it is declined, then um, it will depend on the reason for being declined. Um, there's an obligation on Immigration New Zealand to act um, with having regard to the rules of natural justice. Um, and you, you know, you, you need, there needs to be a degree of transparency. There needs to be an opportunity for you to have stated your case and there needs to be uh, clear evidence of the fact that um, you, you've been listened to, which is not to say that they need to agree with you. Um, so there might be opportunities for challenging a decision or for appealing a decision, um, or in extreme examples, it might be appealing a decision based on humanitarian grounds. Um, so 
different avenues depending on um, what's given rise to um, the decline. Okay, good to know. And I guess uh, one thing I was curious about this because you might have heard from clients along the way, um, you know, some good examples, but I'm just curious, like um, for a lot of clients that potentially might be reaching out, not necessarily to Weta, but let's say less experienced companies in terms of immigrating people over, um, have you had any clients who've given good examples of how they've perhaps applied for work uh, at certain companies and uh, kind of brought up the, um, you know, the, the whole immigration uh, subjects, such as when you're initially applying for a job somewhere saying, by the way, I'm not actually in New Zealand and would require a work permit, that sort of thing. Um, because obviously uh, there's good ways and bad ways to go about anything. And, um, you know, I, I think that having some strategy behind like how you bring that up and address it to the company so that way they don't uh, feel overwhelmed or um, or kind of scared off by the, you know, the fact that they might need to uh, immigrate someone over to uh, specifically work for the company. Right, right. So you, you're talking here about the, 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 the correspondence between the potential applicant or the applicant and, and their potential employer. Exactly. I'm just curious in case you've got some clients who have done really great examples of, um, of how they've kind of applied for a job and, and managed to bring that up um, with their employer to kind of keep them confident about them uh, throughout the process. Because I do imagine that for some employers, especially if they're not familiar with the process, uh, it might sound a lot more scary than it has to be. Uh, so they might get that instant dismissal when really it's just about bringing in a third party such as yourself to kind of handle it all, pay the small fee, and it's more uh, a one-time thing that they don't need to you know, have to go through too much work to deal with themselves. Um, I'll be honest with you and say that um, I haven't had um, much experience with people having been frightened off by the system in advance or, or, or really dealt with the front end where um, potential employees have been talking to potential employers um, and, and without disclosing at the early stage that they're not in the country. Um, but I think that the, the, the system is, might appear overwhelming when, when one first looks at what the options are and what the paperwork is that might need to be filled in and what the evidence that is that might need to be produced. Um, but it isn't necessarily overwhelming. And while it's always good to use the services of, um, of somebody that can, can assist you and walk you through it, it's not impossible to do it yourself, um, but you want to then um, make sure that you pay absolute attention to every detail and that you understand everything that's asked for, um, otherwise it might become a nightmare. Um, in, in terms of guiding people through it, I think that I would come back to, to what I said earlier, which is if in doubt, ask and over answer rather than under answer. Um, and communicate, 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 um, whether that be the potential employee with the potential employer uh, or whether it be with the immigration authorities. So um, don't, don't be intimidated by it. Um, all of these, it's not to say that everybody applies for a visa is given one, and certainly things are becoming more challenging than perhaps they were a while ago, um, but I think that you know, these things fluctuate um, and and seek advice um, when you need it. It might um, end up being uh, the cheapest solution. That's great. And I guess this is a bit of a no-brainer question, but you mentioned before about how you can apply uh, for a visa yourself, but um, what would be some of the advantages of going to a firm such as yours to um, to actually get guidance and get that professional um, support when applying for it like the way i look at um immigration uh is that it's kind of like brain surgery you probably don't want to do it yourself because you'd rather someone who knows every single part um and every single moving part including as you'd mentioned earlier new information and new changes that are coming in so um for me it's it's better to find someone who lives and breathes um this part of the world to specialize in that and be able to take that on to increase your opportunities or or chances but um for others to kind of understand how an immigration firm can um, make their lives a lot less stressful like what would be some of the benefits of having yeah. a firm uh, a good question um certainly you will save yourself money if you do it yourself um, um but um will you stress about 
whether the answers that you've given are going to compromise the outcome. Um, will you have understood uh, what the consequences are of each of the answers that you've given? Um, will it cause delays because you haven't provided what it was that they were really asking for? Um, uh, will there be things that you should have disclosed if you'd really understood the question uh, but which you haven't disclosed and which you'd then need to explain away uh, later? Um, so all of those things are, are reasons why you might want to use um, a good advisor. Um, and as to that point, um, not all advisors um, are equal. Um, there are certainly some advisors that are um, more competent than others, which is not to say that we're the only competent advisors at all. Um, but there is a, a wide variation um, in, in the advisors, unfortunately. Um, so I think perhaps a, a way of answering this question that might be useful for listeners is this. Get good advice, choose your advisor carefully, and cut down on the cost of that advisor by doing as much of um, the hard work yourself. So when you receive a list from your advisor saying, I need the following information, make sure that you assemble all that information in, in the right order, in the right form. Don't assume that a photocopy um, will be okay if you're asked for an original. Um, if you're asked for a notarized copy, a notarized copy is what they want. Um, if they want uh, an original bank statement, don't shrug your shoulders and say, well, there's no such thing as an original bank statement anymore because I get all of my statements on the internet. So th th there are so many things that you can do to cut down the cost by making your advisor's life easier, but you might be well advised to use a good advisor um, to submit your application. That's really great. Uh, and thank you again. Like um, For anyone who wants to reach out to your firm, possibly to acquire uh, your services or find out more information, um, how would they best contact you uh, through your website or... Yeah, through through the website is fine. Uh, but you know, people should feel free to um, drop me an email, give me a call. Um, uh, they'll they'll find all of our details on the website, and um, and and we'd be happy to help. That's really great. Well, again, thank you for taking the time out to uh, chat. This has been really amazing. Uh, my pleasure, and um, thank you very much. Again, I just want to thank Willie for taking the time out to chat. I think that all of this information is so insightful and I'm sure all of us can gain so much knowledge from having gone through this episode. So I hope that you have got a lot from this. And at the same time, if you do have any questions, shoot me an email. I'd love to hear from you. Otherwise, leave a question or comment on the show notes. So go to alanmckay.com slash 128 for episode 128. That being said, I'll be back next episode with Jason Martin, the creature lead responsible for all the amazing creature work at id Software on Doom. Okay, so, and finally, I've got a lot of really cool stuff coming up. As I mentioned, if you want to get onto the Inner Circle VIP list, this is where I give away so much free, high-value, premium content that I don't put available online. And that's pretty much where I put all my time because I really want to reward those who take action. And so this is typically where all of my time goes. Um, and if you want to get on there, simply go to alamckay.com slash inside to join up. It's free. And I'll be putting out everything from actual email scripts that I use to get work, attract clients, uh, negotiate money, all that good stuff, as well as a lot of free uh, videos, talks, uh, guides, a lot of other really cool stuff. And of course, video tutorials and everything else in between there too. So if you want to sign up, go to alamckay.com slash inside. That being said, I'll be back next episode. Until then, rock on. <laughs>